Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here um, for our in-person and uh, hybrid virtual press conference. I'm Andrea Williams from the NRO's Office of Public Affairs, and we are very proud to be here today with our um, Space Force partners and our United Launch Alliance partners. Um, a few points to review before we begin. Today's engagement is on the record, attributed by name to our panelists. Um, the scope of this press conference is Silent Barker and NRO Launch 107, so please stick to launch-related questions. We have 45 minutes today for today's press conference, and if you have any questions after, we have representatives from um, every, all the public affairs offices in the room. We're happy to follow up with you in person or um, virtually on the phone or through email. Um, background information about today's launch can be found on our website, nro.gov, or in the press kits that you have here today in the room. Um, and then before we begin, I'll introduce each panelist and then they will um, give brief opening remarks. Okay, I'll start with Dr. Scalise. Dr. Scalise was sworn in as the director of the National Reconnaissance Office in 2019. He's the 19th director of NRO and the first to be presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed. Dr. Scalise provides direction, guidance, and supervision on matters pertaining to the NRO and executes other authorities specifically delegated by the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence. Before his time at the NRO, he had a distinguished career with NASA. Lieutenant General Michael Gutlein is the commander of the U.S. Space Forces Space Systems Command, where he's responsible for approximately 15,000 employees nationwide and an annual budget of $11 billion. He manages research, design, development, acquisition, launch and sustainment of satellites and their associated command and control systems across more than 20 geographically dispersed units. He has a distinguished military career of more than three decades, including serving as our Deputy Director at NRO from 2019 to 2021. And then Mr. Tori Bruno is the President and CEO of United Launch Alliance. Under his leadership, ULA is transformed into a competitive powerhouse that is shaping the future of space launch by making it more affordable, accessible, and introducing revolutionary new capabilities to meet the challenges of the future. Over the past 35 years, Tori has developed and fielded dozens of critical defense and space launch systems that form the backbone of America's national security and the nation's efforts in space exploration. So welcome, gentlemen, our distinguished panel. Each of the panelists will now take a few moments to share some opening remarks. I'll be begin with you, Dr. Scalise. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's always great to be here on uh, the day before a launch. It's even better on the day of a launch. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to be here with, uh, with two uh, fantastic colleagues, uh, General Gutlein and uh, Tori Bruno. We've worked together for, for many, many years uh, uh, across uh, a number of different missions. Uh, at the NRO, you know, we, uh, we work to provide the nation and the world's best uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities from space. And this upcoming launch, uh, NRO L107, Silent Barker, is a continuation of that. Uh, and it's, it's even more because it indicates an extremely close partnership with our colleagues in the Space Force. Uh, working together, uh, we've developed a, a system in a relatively short amount of time that's gonna provide us with uh, unprecedented coverage of what's going on in the, in the geo belt so that we can understand uh, the intentions of, of other uh, countries uh, to see what they're doing in the geo belt, to see if there's any indications of threats or if it's just normal operations. Um, that capability will just, just allow us to have uh, you know, increased understanding of what's going on there. So we look forward very much to the launch that's coming up in uh, tomorrow. And now I'll turn it over to uh, General Gutlein. Thanks, sir, I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today is, uh, or tomorrow actually, is gonna be a very historic day. If you look at uh, 2019, we stood up the United States uh, Space Force because space was becoming not only congested, but worse yet, contested. Uh, and one of the ways that we're getting after uh, space in this contested environment is through partnerships. Our partnership with our external stakeholders is absolutely critical to our success. And most importantly, our number one partner is the NRO. So this is a commitment to our partnership between the Title 10 and the Title 50 uh, stakeholders. And the capability that we're gonna launch tomorrow goes a long way towards giving us the uh, uh, competitive endurance, competitive advantage in space to make sure we can not only maintain, but uh, not only see, but maintain custody of the threats uh, in GEO. Uh, and has been a very uh, strong partnership with the NRO getting this, uh, this, this uh, capability together and to look forward to the launch tomorrow. Tori? Thank you. Well, 
before I start, I have to say that the bios don't do this justice. These two gentlemen are absolutely amazing leaders. I've known them for a long time. You could not have a better partner in, in any kind of important national security space mission. This is an important area for us, for me personally. I care a great deal about what we do. And I'm just honored to be up here with you guys. The launch is going to be cool. This is our Bruiser configuration of the Atlas. That means it's got five solid rocket motors on it. When you hear 4321 ignition, do not blink because it will leap off the pad. We'll be pulling more than a G before we clear the top of that tower. About, uh, about a minute and a half in, we're going to have fully expended half a million pounds of the solid propellant. We're going to drop those solids off. At three and a half minutes, we'll have crossed the Kármán line with the first stage and be all the way into space. We'll let go of the, uh, the payload fairing at that point, and a minute later, we will actually be entering the LEO regime on the booster at over 20,000 miles per hour. We'll hand it off to the Centaur. It will conduct a whole series of very complex orbital maneuvers to put this payload directly injected into a high energy orbit. My rocket scientists love this mission because it is what Atlas was designed to do, and no other rocket does it better. And personally, this mission, uh, it means a lot to me, as it does to everyone on your teams, I'm sure. There are folks out there working very hard every day to make Earth orbit a rough neighborhood, and this is going to do a lot to keep it the safe, high ground, peaceful high ground that it is meant to be. And so I thank you for entrusting this to us. We will not let you down. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have a, a large number of media on the phone today, so I'm going to go um, in random order, but feel free to pass if you don't have a question, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Most importantly, for those on the line, please dial seven or star six to unmute yourself. So star six to unmute yourself when I call on you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and begin with um, Defense Daily. Do we have Frank Wolf? Defense Daily, are you on the line? Okay. How about Bill Harwood from CBS? Yes, I'm on the line. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Um, Maybe this is for for Chris. I mean, can you give us any more? I'm not talking about details about Stalin Barker, but maybe a more general picture of uh, of what the, the the spacecraft does besides what's in the in the press handout. It, it's hard. I mean, I don't know what space domain awareness is to the average person on the street. So, I mean, just some general terms on that. I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Certainly, Bill. Uh, so the the idea of of the mission is to put a satellite in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, and then to be looking at that orbital regime uh, and get a sense of what's happening day to day. So, um, and satellites do move in geosynchronous orbit. You've heard about communication satellites moving from one location to another to provide better coverage for, for other areas. Um, certainly we want to be able to, to see that so we know what, what is going on in that area. But we also want to know if there is something going on that is unexpected or shouldn't be going on that could potentially represent a threat to uh, a high value asset, um, either ours or one of our allies. Um, so that's the purpose of it. It's really to, to, to be a, a watchdog in, in that orbital regime, in the geosynchronous orbit. And when you think about it, geosynchronous orbit is, is about 24,000 miles, 40,000 kilometers away from the Earth, so it's pretty hard to see from the ground. So having something that is in that orbit provides us much, much better coverage, and it will allow Space Force, NRO, and others to have a much, much better understanding of what's going on in the geosynchronous orbit. Hope that helps, Bill. Definitely. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, space light now in the room. Do you have a question? Back there now? Um, yeah, sure. So, a uh, question for, for Tori, I suppose, and, and for the other partners if you'd like to add anything. Um, 
you know, this is the last NRO mission that Atlas is going to be flying, you know, as ULA begins to transition into Vulcan. If you could just speak about both from a, a high level, you know, the significance of making that transition and also the technological transition of, of going from Atlas to, to Vulcan, you know, with these NASA security missions. Obviously, yeah. there are a couple certification flights before then, but, you know, just marking the moment. Of sure. Great question. It's bittersweet. I mean, we've done 97 national security space missions, I believe 33, if I have the number right, just for the NRO. And this will be Atlas's final mission for NRO. So, you know, at, in the 551 configuration, you know, this is uh, such an exciting mission. It's our mission that we're designed for, so it's kind of a fitting way to end that. So, but it means a lot to our guys. You're gonna see people with a little tear in the corner of their eye. However, we move from here to Vulcan and Vulcan will have actually more capability than Atlas, a little bit more than the Delta IV Heavy in a single stick. So as we transition forward, we're gonna bring more things that we can do to contribute to the fight and to the peace. And you know, we'll be flying that hopefully uh, in Q4 and uh, we'll continue on the great legacy of Atlas. In a way, it's kind of like an Atlas VI of Vulcan is. <laughs> Think of it that way. Great, thanks. Um, on the line, do we have anyone from Florida today? Jamie or Rick? Anyone from Florida today on the line? Okay, what about Stephen Clark from Ars Technica? Stephen Clark, are you on the line? We must have scared him off, Chris. Oh, we can hear you. Yes, go ahead, Stephen. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think my question is probably for General Gutlein or Dr. Scalise. Um, uh, first of all, can you tell us anything about the number of spacecraft? Is this just one spacecraft or, or is it multiple? And if so, can you say how many are in this, in this constellation for Silent Barker? And uh, secondly, you know, the NRO often, almost always, has their missions, uh, you know, to be fully classified. Uh, you're talking a little bit about what Silent Barker is doing. Wondering if, uh, if General Goodline or Dr. Scalise could talk about the decision to, to open up about this particular mission, why uh, talk about the details about Silent Barker, whereas uh, you don't do that with other missions. Thanks. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to be uh, uh, more transparent and, and share more information. Clearly, the, the space domain is you know, we often say it's it's you know contested, congested, um, uh, etc. Uh, competitive. Uh, it's also becoming you know easier and easier to see what's going up there. Um, and you know, we want to we, we want to let uh, people know to some extent, you know, what our capabilities are. And, and this is one capability that that um, if you think about it, uh, has great value beyond just you know the national security community and and oftentimes it's forgotten that the NRO and and I'll let General Gutlein talk about Space Force but the NRO supports more than just the national security community the Department of Defense and the intelligence community it also supports the civil community a, a number of civil agencies <coughs> rely on, on the data from uh, from NRO satellites to deal with uh, natural disasters um, uh, and you know things along those lines humanitarian assistance uh, in this case, it's going to provide us with, uh, you know, a lot more understanding of what's going on in, in, uh, in space to understand, you know, what, what is happening up there. So that's a, that's a critical capability that uh, I think people should be, uh, should be aware that we're doing. I know, General. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So a, a, a huge part of uh, the Space Force mission is not only to defend but to deter aggression. Uh, a huge element of deterrence is the ability for the adversary to know what we can and cannot see. So we actually want our competitors to know that we have eyes in GEO and that we can see what's happening in GEO. And not only are we going to maintain the uh, custody and the be able to detect what's going on in GEO, but we'll have the indications and warnings to know there's something out of the uh, uh, normal occurring. Uh, and that goes a long way towards uh, deterrence. To Tyrants want to work in the dark, <clears throat> and you're going to shed light on them. That's a good way to say it. Good way to say it. Yeah. And Stephen, to answer your question, it's multiple payloads, but we're not sharing exact numbers. More than one, as Dr. Scalise has said in the past. 
Okay, um, do we have CNN on the line? Jackie? Jackie from CNN? Okay, Micah from Wall Street Journal, are you on the line? Wall hey, it's Micah here. Oh. Can everybody hear me? Great, we can hear you. Thanks. Go ahead. Hey, good, thanks. Uh, good morning. At Dr. Galicia, uh, Lieutenant General Gutlein, could you talk a little bit about, like, sort of the run-up to this mission, like, the, the history of the spacecraft? Like, when did NRO and Space Force and other partners realize they you guys wanted this capability, um, and how long did it take to get to this point? And then looking forward a little bit, um, how long are the payloads expected to operate? Thanks a lot. Sure. Um, so I would say, Mike, was about five years ago that, uh, yep. that uh, both organizations, uh, both Space Force and, and NRO, realized that we needed uh, a better understanding of what was going on in, in the geo belt. Uh, and uh, since we both recognize it somewhat independently, uh, we r routinely get together. Uh, we have a, a fairly tight relationship uh, uh, where we work together on, on planning for, for missions and realized that we were both kind of looking in the same direction and decided to team up together. Uh, after we did that, uh, we quickly um, uh, developed a capability and about three years from the time that we had decided what we wanted to, to do about three years ago is when we decided what we really wanted to do to now so it's about a three-year development to build these uh, to build these satellites and uh, and I guess that's that that pretty much uh, kind of captures the history of uh, of what was going on with it Mike, did you want to add anything to it? Yeah, so when we when we looked at the mission, uh, we both are operating in GEO. We both needed the indications and warnings. We both needed to know what was going on uh, in GEO. And it really was a perfect match because the NRO is really good at building satellites uh, for ISR. Uh, and what we were really asking for was an ISR satellite uh, in GEO to, to not only detect but to maintain custody of what's happening in GEO. So by leveraging the NRO's uh, mission domain experience in uh, ISR as well as their uh, acquisition authorities in partnership with uh, Space Force's ability to uh, have assured access to space, it really was a great partnership. Great, thank you. Um, Joey Roulette from Reuters, are you on the line? Joey from Reuters. It takes a minute to unmute. Okay, how about Frank Wolf, Defense Daily? Frank Wolf, are you on the line? All right, how about San Sandra Irwin with Space News? Sandra, are you on the line? Yes, hi, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, good morning, Sandra. Great, good morning, thank you. Um, I have a question for Tori Bruno. Um, the Space Systems Command said um, that there's one remaining, um, after the launch of NRO 107, there's one remaining Atlas launch for the security space. Um, when is this, launch, when is this final uh, Atlas launch for NSSL, and um, when do you anticipate the first Vulcan launch for National Security Space? Thank you very much. You were breaking up a little, Sandra, but I think you asked me when would the last um, Atlas launch for National Security Space, and when would the first Vulcan launch for National Security Space? Does that sound yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, because the, the, pre the press release yeah. says that it's only next year for both. Next year, okay. The, the final. At yeah, you're breaking up a yeah, lot. I'm sorry, I just Sandra, can you repeat your question? We can't hear you. Um, yeah, the question is. Um, the final national security atlas launch 
uh, which would be there's one more after the one tomorrow. When is that and what mission is it? It's early next year in mission. I want to say 51. SF 51. I'm looking at you, sir, for confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> We will follow up with you, Sandra, and make sure I gave you the right story. But it is next year, and I believe it's uh, USSF 51. And I, I don't believe I'm in the window yet when I can tell you more precisely in terms of timing than I just did. I think we're still in the FOUO window. Great. Thanks, Sandra. Got it. Thanks, um, Do we have anyone from Fox 35 on the phone? Fox 35? Last call for Fox 35. Okay. What about Tony Capaccio from Bloomberg? Is Bloomberg on the line? All right. Let's go with Aviation Week. Brian Everstein. Aviation Week, are you on the line? Can you hear me? Oh, yep, yeah, we can hear you, Brian. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can I just clarify, I've heard there's multiple payloads. Is, is this in the, are there multiple launches as part of Silent Barker? And also, um, can you just go over the schedule for IOC and FOC? Are you looking still looking at FOC for 2026? Thanks. Uh, yes, there's multiple launches, which is why FOC is 2026. So you uh, you captured that right. Brian, did that answer your question? Brian, did I get your question? Yes, sorry. Okay. Trying to unmute. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, in the room, go ahead. I think we're in the space up close. Um, I wonder if you guys could tell us Anchoring the space up close. Can you tell us, uh, maybe in general terms, what, what's different or enhanced about these capabilities of this satellite? And um, is, it a, is, it a, is it a completely new design? Can it affect satellites in space, or is it just a different thing? It is a completely new design. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we do strive to advance technology where, where we can. We utilize what's what's available and we rely on, on commercial capabilities as well. But in this particular case, we recognize that we needed to do something, you know, very, uh, very different. Um, and um, it, the geosynchronous orbit is, is far away, as I said, and ground-based systems have a harder time seeing what's up there. Um, so this provides us the capability of being in this, in the same orbit so that we're closer to, to what's happening up there. And it will not be looking at the ground, it will be looking at space. So it is looking at space. Mike, did you want to add anything? No, so you, you got it right. So today we primarily rely on our ground-based radars. Our ground-based radars are, are pretty exquisite, uh, but they pretty much can only see about a basketball size uh, object in uh, space. And because of the challenges of day, night, and weather, it gets extremely hard to maintain custody of those objects. So by actually moving the, the sensor into orbit uh, with those objects, we can actually not only detect smaller objects, but maintain custody of them. And when they operate out of the norm, we get indications of warning that there's something here that helps us to maintain in a contested environment that we can understand when our high value assets, think, think of a strategic missile warning that's also up there, that those objects might be uh, in harm's way and that we need to take a different action. So by getting closer to the environment, we can actually see more objects and maintain custody of those objects. So this sounds like a huge increase in capability. It is. It is, It's exponential. Yes. yes. From a little basketball to a giant, huge increase in capability from a little basketball-sized thing to a gigantic satellite. It well, is, not, not necessarily the size of the object, but maintaining all-weather, day-night capability, and being able to maintain 100% custody of those objects as they maneuver in and in around uh, GEO. Right. Okay, great. 
Thanks, yeah. thanks. On the phone, do we have Courtney Albin from C4ISRnet? Courtney, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, real quick just about um, if you can say anything about the health of the, the current uh, uh, legacy SBSS uh, constellation, the satellites that are, that are still on orbit. Um, and then also, um, you know, we hear, we hear, um, we've heard a lot lately from uh, Space Command about the, the need for dynamic space operations and, um, you know, understanding that this is um, kind of a, a newer requirement that's being talked about more now. Um, I'm curious how Silent Barker um, satellites, you know, fit into that, um, fit in that vision and, and if um, these satellites will be able to provide that sort of um, maneuverability and or if that's sort of like a, um, as you look at future capabilities for Silent Barker, if, if um, how you consider that need, um, uh, you know, from Space Command. It, well, I mean, the um, you captured it very well actually in your in your question. Um, uh, what Silent Barker is is going to do is provide that that indications and warnings so it can can uh, inform uh, decisions about what we do or don't need to do in in terms of maneuver or uh, awareness. Um, so it, it's a great increase in our understanding of what of what uh, we'll be able to do and we'll greatly improve our ability to uh, to uh, determine you know future courses of action uh, the um, and it's it's really important I mean sp space command is, is uh, absolutely correct in saying that space has become a much more uh, dynamic environment when you think of the number of satellites that are up there the importance of space to everything we do from communications to navigation um, to uh, you know, uh, weather prediction, which we're relying on very much for tomorrow, <laughs> um, to um, you know, understanding disaster, you know, wh when when there's potential for a natural disaster. So space is becoming you know increasingly important, and having you know increased awareness is uh, is very important. It also requires us to operate in closer conjunction with each other, so that we can. Um, stay out of each other's way, but also so we can operate very efficiently in space. Uh, and that's what we do. We work very closely with, uh, with Space Command uh, as well um, on those types of things. I think I captured most of your question, but I'll... Yeah, and Courtney, on the, on the question of SBSS, we can't comment on the current status uh, of an operational asset. Over. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Um, do we have Greg Pallone from Spectrum, Spectrum News 13 on the line? Greg, are you the, on the line? Spectrum News 13. Okay, what about Sean Cannon from Ad Astra Magazine? Sean, are you on the line? Okay, how about Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense? Are you on? Teresa, are you on the line? How about Michael Sheets from CNBC? Michael, are you on the line? All right. How about Danny Lentz from NASA Space Flight? Danny, are no you the question from us. Oh, no question? Okay. Um, Richard from Orlando Sentinel, are you on the line? Richard, are you on the line? All 
All right. How about Marsha Smith, Marcia Smith with Space Policy Online? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Marsha. Uh, thanks so much. I'm wondering, uh, Chris, maybe you could talk about who is actually going to have access to this data. I mean, are, you're obviously going to share it within the national security community, but are you going to share it with international partners with the commercial sector if the commercial sector is worried about something that's going on up there can they contact you and ask you if you can check on things for them well we're still you know working out um, a number of different policy things but the intent is to um, uh, understand what's going on up there and be able to provide that information to the users that need it i can't really go much more than that into it Is that okay, Marcia? Sure. Can you talk at all about the sharing arrangements, especially with international partners? Uh, well, that's uh, the the sharing usually uh, it goes through Space Command, um, typically, and we, yes, we do share information with uh, with international partners. So, Marcia, I think an, an easier way of saying it is that uh, this data will come to the DOD. The DOD will use this data to continue to maintain the space catalog and provide that space catalog uh, free uh, to not only our commercial partners, but our international partners. So this data will allow us to have a uh, better uh, defined space catalog of the objects in uh, geosynchronous orbit and of what the behavior of those objects is, over. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do we Thanks. have Brett from space.com on the line? Brett, are you on the line? <clears throat> yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great. I'm wondering if um, any information can be shared about which uh, manufacturers or contractors have been working on the Silent Barker program or who might be working on it going forward. Thank you. I'm sorry, we can't share that information at this time. Uh, okay, thank you. Did you have anything else you wanted to ask? <laughs> no, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, Melanie Holt from WFTV Orlando. Melanie, are you on the line? Okay. How about Michael Kane with Spaceflight Now? Michael? And just a reminder to push star six to unmute yourself. Star six. Michael. Michael. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Embarrassing. Sorry. And I introduced myself to you too. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Jennifer Glass with CBC. Jennifer, are you on the line? Anyone from Canadian Broadcast Corporation? Okay, how about Susanna Chamberlain with ABC7? All right, do we have any other questions in the room? I don't know if we, I missed anyone. Oh, go ahead. Uh, thanks again for doing this. that certified to do these national security space launches. Could you go into some detail? And is there a certain number of launches you have to have successful before they'll put their valuable satellites on there? Thank you. Yeah, sure, Ken. Um, so the, you know, the bottom line is our CERT plan calls for two flights. The one that we'll do you know, this year in Q4 and then one that we'll do very early next year. Then we would be certified to fly for national security space it also covers our needs for NASA, for NASA missions that are in that highest category where the lowest tolerance for risk exists. Um, to give you more than that, what's our path to first flight, which I keep saying is Q4? The only thing we have left to do is a structural qual test of the Centaur upper stage propellant tank. That's it. Everything else is done. 
We've been down here to the pad a couple of times, tanked the booster. We've even conducted uh, flight readiness firings. That effort to get that, uh, basically, it's a pressure test, essentially, uh, is underway right now. We'll, we'll do that at the Marshall Space Flight Center with a test article here in just a couple of months. Uh, the article that will fly is being built. It's fully welded up as a tank. It, uh, it'll be in a proof pressure test like any day now at, down at our factory in Decatur. We'll put Sophie insulation on it, bolt all of the avionics to it, and ship it down here on the rocket ship. So it's literally path to flight is one thing. Everything else, 99% qualified in the vehicle, and then we'll go fly it twice, and we'll be in a position to support General Gutlein here. Can you talk about the interaction with the Space Force doing all that work? Yeah, sure. So when you set up a CERT plan, you kind of have two broad paths you can, you can take. You can say, go away and don't bother me. I don't want you to slow me down. Um, and I'll show up when I'm ready, and then you generally have to fly several times, three, four times, even five times. Or you can say, I recognize that you're an awesome partner, <laughs> and why don't you come in on the first day, and we'll work together on this. You'll attend all the meetings, you'll see all the data, and we'll do this incrementally as we go through. That's the path we chose to take. And as we have progressed through all of this, of course, it's our program, we're responsible, we're accountable, but our government partners have been there every step of the way, and when they have opinions on things, technical opinions on how things are going, they share them with us, we value them, and uh, the partnership's been great, and we're right, we're right at the end. We're 99% done, and have valued the way we did it. We made the right choice. Yeah, it really has been a very strong partnership along the way. We don't just walk in at the end and grade your homework. Uh, we have, you know, decades of launch experience, and we want ULA to be successful. So we were sitting there every day shoulder to shoulder with them as they're going through all the engineering reviews and all the tests and then reviewing all the test data. And it's very is collaborative back and forth. Uh, have you guys thought about this? Have you guys thought about this? Uh, and and it, it's very much a teamwork uh, from, the, from the very beginning. Yeah, and this is another example where NRO and, and Space Force work very, very closely together um, because obviously we ride on these rockets, so we want to know what's going on and, and we're very, very much involved with it uh, as well. So it's a, it's a really tight partnership in, in this case between industry, Space Force, and NRO. Great, and when thanks. we talk about the context of a mission like this, I would point out that this is the great power of our system. The partnership that exists between industry and its, its ability to invest, its ability to innovate, and our government and government uh, and you know military customers that have the needs that we strive to, to support. This allows us to go faster and to have better technology and to get in front of adversaries when they want to threaten us in the space domain. All right, thank you guys. Good question. Okay, we're going to go back on the phone. Um, Melanie from WFTV Orlando, are you on? Yes, good morning and thank you for your time. I, I really had a weather related question uh, about Idalia uh, intensifying in the Gulf. Uh, obviously, if there's some issue where you cannot launch uh, tomorrow, what is the backup plan? Yeah, we'll come back on the range when we can. So I'll give you the latest. All right, so as of how, however long we've been sitting up here, um, we're obviously watching the storm pretty closely. Uh, our POV, our probability of violating weather for tomorrow is currently assessed at 20%, which is really good. That means we got an 80% PGO. The thing that we will be watching for tomorrow are what we call cumulus and anvil clouds which is another way of saying lightning. We really hate it when the rocket gets struck by lightning. And so that, that kind of weather makes that more likely. However, that's an, basically a 58 minute, basically an hour long launch window tomorrow at 8.34 a.m. If we can't make that, we would have to go for the next day. Well, it completely flips. Uh, the next day, it's only a 20% go and the concern will be high winds. We can take about 54 knots sitting on the pad. Uh, and so if we can't make that, then our next opportunity on the range is a few days off. You know, 
I won't give you the date yet because it's still in coordination, but we'll have to wait. And so we're going to be making a decision tomorrow because high winds are a thing that don't get solved by staying on the ground. Lightning is. And it takes us 24 hours, once we're fully tanked, to get our cryos back off so we can roll back to the VIF and button it up to protect it from the winds. So if we can't go tomorrow morning, we'll be looking at that weather very carefully and we'll make a decision about whether or not we can risk it for the backup day. If we can't, we'll roll back to the barn and we'll wait till it's safe. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the phone, do we have Irene from Aviation Week? Irene, are you on the line? And reminder to hit star six to unmute. Someone's unmuted. <laughs> okay, Irene, are you on the line? All right, let's go to Defense Scoop. Michaela, are you on the line, Defense Scoop? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Hi, go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, I just had a couple of questions about post-launch activities. Um, first, what does the, I guess, test and checkout phase for this initial payload look like in terms of time, timeline? And then once um, Silent Barker reaches full operational capability in 2026, who is going to be operating it? Will it be NRO or Delta II at Spock, a combination of both? Um, any clarification on that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, this is, a, as we talked about, this is a new payload, so so the timelines are a little bit, uh, a little bit fluid, but um, uh, think about uh, 30 to 90 days uh, for a, a checkout uh, phase and and getting uh, into operations. Uh, and then uh, it, it'll be operated, you know, jointly um, at, uh, um, uh, at the SPOC, so uh, at NSDC. So it's a, it's a joint mission and we're working, we're working together. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, just to clarify, will it be Delta II that will operate this? Mm -hmm. No, it will not be. Okay. Can you share which which portion of Spock? Uh, it'll be uh, with our the, the data will come into the NSDC with our operators located at Colorado Springs, uh, but the, the satellite itself will be maintained by the NRO. Okay. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Great. Thank you. Um, do we have Rick from WFIT Melbourne on the line? Rick, are you on the line? All right, I'm just going to do one go back. Teresa Hitchens, are you on from Breaking Defense? I think I covered everyone. We have time for one more question. If anyone on the line, I missed you, feel free to unmute. Star six. That's Bill Harwood. I've got an extra question. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, there was some, I have a little confusion about the multiple payloads answer to two earlier questions. Are you saying there's multiple payloads on the rocket tomorrow? Are there multiple payloads on all the launches in the Silent Barker program, or were you meaning you're having multiple launches with single payloads? I was just unclear about what the multiple referred to. Thanks. Bill, a uh, strange way to answer the question is yes. So, <laughs> so, the, so yes, there are multiple payloads on tomorrow's launch, uh, and then future launches uh, may or may not have multiple payloads. Okay, thanks. In the back of the room, did you have one? Go ahead. Oh, just um, um, how many launches are expected in the Silent Parker program? Uh, right now we're thinking two, but, uh, but obviously there'll be refurbishments as, as we go along. So, so two in the current plan and then perhaps more as, uh, as the satellites age out. 
Great. Well, it is 945, so that includes our press conference. Thank you all for being here, and let's go NRO Launch 107. Hopefully we launch off tomorrow on time. Thank you Indeed. all. 107. Yes.